Ruiz. Hello and welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by Funkinslift.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I'm your host, Scott Dr. Jake Skolfein, musicologist and author of Everything is on the One, The First Guy to Funk. If you don't have your copy, get on over to Amazon and pick one up. You'll be so glad you did. Whether you're watching the video version of this at Funkinstuff.net or on YouTube or listening to the audio-only podcast version from providers like iTunes and Spotify. As always, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in the show. Speaking of which, if you haven't already done so, subscribe to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube. That's where Truth and Rhythm lives. All kinds of goodies you'll get, uh, early premieres, and it's all free, so make sure you sign up. Tell a friend, tell family. Also get your official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff gear at the FunkinStuff.net store. Cool stuff like I'm wearing right here, Truth and Rhythm shirts, show your support and love of the show and also the musicians and the music that they represent. Um, also want to give a shout out to the Funk Exhibition Center and Hall of Fame in Dayton, Ohio, of which I'm very proud to be an official Funk Ambassador. Go to thefunkcenter.org to learn more and keep the funk alive. And now, with all that, it's time to get on with the show. Enjoy. Hey, I'm pleased to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership keyboardist singer Kevin Lassiter, who during the mid to late 1970s was a member of the KGs, as well as that group's mentors, Cool and the Gang. With guitarist Kevin Bell, the younger brother of Robert Cool Bell and Ronald Bell, the latter of whom guided and produced the KGs, the band burst onto the funk scene in 1974 with the very Cool and the Gang-like smash hit, You've Gotta Keep on Bumping. The group would go on to release four studio albums and several more top-notch funk and dance tracks, including Get Down, Who's the Man with the Master Plan, On the Money, Hustle with Every Muscle, and Waiting at the Bus Stop. Before they called it a day, Lassiter had moved on to the parent band, appearing on Cool and the Gangs of Force and Everybody's Dancing albums. Lassiter's subsequent projects included another funky R&B group called Forecast, which released one album in 1982. Kevin, thank you for joining the show. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, Scott. Glad to be here. Yes. Glad to have you. And where where are we having you from today? I'm in I'm located in Broadway, New Jersey now. And originally, you're from that general area, right? Uh, right. We uh, grew up in Jersey City. Uh -huh. Grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. So how are you holding up with this crazy 2020? You doing okay so far? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm coping with it. I'm coping with it. And, you know, I'm one of those essential workers that we have to be to work every day, working for the housing authority. So we have to keep up all the complexes and take care of the tenants. Yeah, all the emergency needs that they have. So, you know, you know just staying safe, staying safe and trying to keep everything disinfected. Well, good. That's a valuable uh, a role right there. So thank you for yes. that beyond the music. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. Well, there'll be a few weeks before folks see this. And I always hope, you know, when I do these and we're in the middle of the, uh, you know, pandemic situation that by the time this airs, we'll be in a lot better situation. So we'll keep our fingers crossed on that. That'll be great. That'll be great. Yeah. You're looking forward to some better times. Absolutely. Better times, like maybe all the way back in the mid '70s, or uh, even going beyond that, because I want to find out, Kevin, uh, what first drew you to music and the keyboards and all that. Uh, my first draw to music was a set of drums that I got for Christmas. 
I was always banging on the table with my fingers, and uh, I guess my father seen that, and he bought me a, a small set of drums, and I started off on that. Also, we had we, my mother was a, a classical pianist, so she, we always had a piano in the house, and I used to tinker with that. I had a good ear for music, so everything that came on, I would try to uh, to play. So I. I basically stayed in the house all day when everybody else was outside, you know, playing sports and everything. I was in there tinkling on the piano and messed around and got a hold of that, yeah. And, and like that, better than uh, the drums. I got off the drums and started playing the piano. Mm -hmm. And then in high school, I guess grammar school, you, you get a little uh, different instruments, training, off of like clarinet, so so forth, so on. In high school, I, I switched off to the trumpet, started to play the trumpet. So I had a little bit of, uh, once you uh, have, I, I have the, the grass of the piano, the whole grass of the piano, so it's easier to, to branch off to other instruments because now you have an understanding of music theory, theory, chords, scales, and uh, other things, messing around. After that, started messing with the guitar. So yeah, pretty much like all the instruments, but uh, like the piano the best. The piano wow. the best. You really made your rounds with the different types of instruments. You got a feel of yes. everything. <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, what you know types of music were you into, uh, say, in your teens and your formative years? Who are some of your heroes? Oh boy, oh boy, uh, all the artists. I used to listen to radio, uh, all the old DJs, Harry, what was his name? Harry Harrison, uh, or WMCA, I guess had a bunch of DJ, they had played music. My first, my best group was the Rascals. Hmm. With Felix Cavalieri and uh, Dino Danelli and uh, those guys, uh, I forgot the other two guys, uh, Eddie Brigatti, they were out of Garfield. And uh, yeah, that was the first albums I started buying. I started listening to them. And it was always Sly Stone, it was Sly, it was, uh, who else, Chicago, uh, so many groups, Doodles, Beals, uh, oh boy. I tried to take some of those groups back there. Well, that's when music was music. So, I mean, everything, I, I liked everything back then. Everything. Every genre. Yeah. From pop, R&B, jazz, Herbie Hancock, mm. Stanley Clark, uh, Weather Report, uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, of course. Uh, I don't want to leave anybody out, but, uh, but uh, there were so many, uh, so many groups so many groups that, that uh, uh, enhanced the music so much, yeah, that, that was great. It was great. Those times were great. 50s, the doo-wop groups, uh, Platters, mm -hmm. who else? Uh, Lil' Anthony and Imperials, uh, all the, uh, then coming up in the 60s, Motown, all the Motown groups, Temptations, Supremes, uh, the girl groups, girl groups, which uh, I forgot their names, but uh, the Shirelles, I guess the Shirelles. Um, going into the later 60s, that's when Cool and them had their first hit in the late 60s. So that really took off, and that, that was, uh, that, they were our idols coming from Jersey City. We grew up, you know. We watched them actually on the um, what was it, Soul Town, Soul Town Review. I guess they used to play in the streets uh, uh, for the city. So we always got a chance to see them and idolize them. And uh, we were hanging out on the street, and they were practicing. They had a practice right around the corner from us. And after their practice, they would come down. George Brown would come down with his sticks. And he'd be playing on the mailbox. Ricky West was uh, always uh, an idol of mine. He, he lived not too far from 
from where I lived and used to watch him play, try to pick up some tips from him. But uh, it was a lot of music, a lot of music. Do you, do you remember, um, I mean, you were already aware of Cool and the Gang then, sounds like, before they really started taking off yeah. nationally. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, when they did take off like they did, um, were you guys surprised? Or, I'm sure you were excited. Oh, excited. Excited. Definitely excited. You know, knowing the guys and then watching them take off, watching them have a hit record and you're hearing it on the radio, Cool and the Gang by Cool and the Gang. And that first, that first album, oh, it, was, it was just, uh, uh, it was, you played it over and over, over and over. Yeah, to hear that stuff, just to get it in your system. And yeah. most of the groups from Jersey City were trying to emulate or copy off of them. Hmm. Eight, eight piece bands, yeah. Yeah, they had, um that unique horn sound, you know, yes. very identifiable, yeah. just real oh, yeah. powerful and uh, just blasts of brass and woodwind, yes. you know? Yeah, yeah. that was uh, uh, Spike Mickens on trumpet, uh, Dennis Thomas on on, on alto, and, and Brother Khalees Ronald Bell, uh, you, who used to do the horn lines. Oh man, the horns were fantastic, fantastic guys, yeah. What was like your first, uh, group or band experience and, and how, you know, how much of that did you do before you became part of the KGs? We, uh, I was with a band called the Whole Notes and it was, uh, we did, it was just a rhythm section. So we did backup for a group that had a record out um, in Jersey City. They were the Soul Generation and they did a record called Body and Soul had a hit called Body and Soul and Million Dollars. And so um, the organ player that was playing with the band, he left and went in the military. And they came and got me. I don't know. What, well, we, there was only a couple guys that around Jersey City that played keys. So they came and got me. And we uh, linked up and we went on the road as a backup, as the, as the band for that singing group. And uh, that was that experience. With, with, that was the first band. Did, were you thinking at that point that you were going to do a career in music or you were not sure or what? I thought so. I thought so. I thought it was going to be a longevity thing with that it, because it was very fruitful at the time. It's very fruitful. I mean, the music, you can go from one band to another or, you know, just uh, do your own, create your own band. People were leaving bands and, and, and taking part in other bands. And, it, and the music was so fruitful. I mean, the, um, the traveling was great. You got to get out of your city, get out of the ghetto and, and go and visit other cities, see other places and uh, get paid for it. And, that was a good thing. <laughs> and what was your family supportive of that? Uh, yes, 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 mm -hmm. they were very. That helps. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. So, uh, what was the series of events that led to the forming of the KGs? And were were you a were you part of the original configuration, or was there something before that? There was a, another keyboard player that was right around the corner from me. And we, I mean, we grew up together. His sister played drums and he played keyboards and they were well known in that area. So he was the first one that linked up with Kevin, uh, Cool's brother, Cool's young brother, Kevin Bell played guitar. And they had the group first, uh, KGs. I never asked what happened to them, but he, he left for some reason or other. Uh, you know, sometimes everything doesn't work out well. So uh, I had I had uh, came off the road with uh, backing up the Soul Generation, and uh, they needed a keyboard player. So I went up to uh, to uh, see if see if I worked out with them. You know, worked out with them, and they loved me. They they loved me. They took me in. 
I mean, the first first rehearsal. Yeah, first rehearsal. So yeah, I've been with them. After that, I was with them ever since. Yeah. Did it did they have? Felt. Did, did they have any of the tracks yet that would make it on that first album, or were they playing covers, or what? They just had that hit. They just had the hit, uh, Keep On Bumping Out. That had already came out. That record had already came out, and it was playing on the radio. It had uh, good airplay. Good airplay all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that record, to me, I mean, I love so much funk, um, but um, and there's so many classics during that period is a classic era, but still yeah. that track just stands out. I mean, it's yeah, so yeah. catchy and it makes you feel so good <laughs> and it makes you just bounce and, and, and the changes, everything just is great yeah. on that track. Oh, strong track, strong track. Yeah. Very powerful. And that's one of, uh, uh, Ronald Bell's. Yeah. That's one of Khalees's, uh, uh, you know, his, that's, that's his touch. That's his touch on it. Once you hear that, that's his touch with the horns and the, and the rhythm. Yeah, that's all him. Even though it's so long, you still never want it to end. At least I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, when he put that little party part on the back where everybody was like partying. Yeah. 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 Um, when you got with the group, first off, do you know how they came up with the name? I mean, I always assumed it was uh, the K and the G was intentional because of the cool and the gang. Connected. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty much that's pretty much how they came up with KGs. Yeah, KGs. We yeah. were the little little brothers. Yeah, so yeah, KGs copying off of them. Everything they did, we did. Yeah, so I guess it, it fit. Yeah. How much it, how much younger was Kevin than Ronald? Oh, he was much younger, much younger. I, I would say uh, maybe 10, 15 years younger. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So what was it like when you got in that band and how did it differ from what you had been doing? Uh, it was it was more expansive. I mean, eight pieces compared to four piece four piece rhythm section. That eight piece we could do so much more. We could do so much more with the music. Uh, I was playing keys, um, uh, also, Kevin was playing clavinet and guitar, and we had the bass player, Mike Cheeks, drummer, his brother was Cali Cheeks, uh, their cousin was playing congas, Wilson Beckett. Uh, then we had the horn players, uh, Dennis White was on uh, tenor, uh, Ray Wright, Ray Wright was uh, from uh, he was playing trumpet, and then we had Peter Duart. Peter Duart was playing the uh, alto, and yeah, those guys were great. Those guys were great, and uh, we we were all from the same area, around the same area, basically the same high school. Yeah. I think some people wondered, you know, if it if it was the same horn section for both, but the KGs did have their own horn section. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Everybody thought. Everybody really thought that it was cool and the gang's horns playing the horn parts, but no, uh, Ronald would teach the horn, the our horn guys the parts, and they sounded just like Cool and the Gang's horn parts, yeah. but they would, they actually played the parts. So, uh, Kevin, when you went in, you went into the studio, I assume, to work on what would be the album. They already had the track out, and then they put an album around it. Yes. Um, what, what do you remember about that experience? Uh, what I remember was uh, Ronald taking us into the studio, and he had he had uh, all the music. He had he had a couple of uh, well he had he had a collection of songs that he wanted to do. Um, I think the other one at that time was uh, Who's the Man with the Master Plan. I think we worked on that, and then went to some other stuff that he had. But um, he had so many songs that we just we just went right through them and learned them. He uh, we took them back to the practice hall that we had, learned them, then went to the studio. I don't know if we did them one by one. I think I think we did the whole album uh, as a whole instead of doing 
tr track by track. I think we went in yeah, and did the whole album. So there's maybe, I forgot how many songs were on that first. I have it here. It's uh, 10, well, 10 tracks. 10 tracks, yeah. 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 Um, that came out in 74. Very uh, unusual title. They wanted to hype up the uh, hit so much that they actually called the album a uh, keep on bumping and master plan. And master plan, <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, that was the hype. That was the hype, yeah. Um, I, I noticed that you also were credited for uh, percussion on that. Um, and how'd you get the ice nickname? Oh, oh boy, that that's was back in the, growing up in the streets of Jersey City. I guess we all had our little clubs. I wouldn't call them gangs. We weren't doing any violent stuff or, or getting in tr trouble too much. We had clubs, little clubs that uh, guys would join. And everybody had a nickname. Each guy had a nickname uh, depending on his personality. I guess uh, we just made up nicknames for everybody. And I guess I used to love the cold. I, we used to play football out in the cold when I never got cold. I used to come outside, no hat, uh, no coat, just playing in the snow with everybody else. So I don't remember who it was, but he said, uh, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna call you Ice. And that was back in mid 60s that was maybe around 65 66 so that was way back yeah yeah so i had that name from from a kid from a kid and it stuck with me that's everybody knew me as ice <laughs> well you gotta live up to that and be extra cool with a name like ice. <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> so how much did uh, you kind of formulate your own keyboard parts on that first record? And how much, you know, did Ronald, how did Ronald Bell direct the group overall? Um, basically, he had the songs. He had the songs already. Um, those were his songs. But he allowed us to put our input, play it the way that we wanted to play. I guess uh, we all... Uh, we all um, uh, put our input into it as, as uh, we felt. Play, play what you feel. He let us play what we feel. We had to stick to the parts and the changes, how they came. But you could, you could variate on a chord. On a chord, you could substitute other chords. Or you, can, you could improv, you know, use some improv improvisation. He would allow that. And, he, you know, things that he liked. If he didn't like it, <laughs> No, you, then then you couldn't change it. Yeah, you just play it straight. He tell you play it straight. Yeah, play that straight. He wanted to keep it simple, of course, uh, for commercial commercial reasons. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Don't don't get too far out there. Don't put no jazz stuff in there. You know, we wanted we want to airplay, and that was the uh, that was the direction we got from colleagues from Tali Steve. He was great. He was a great mentor. You know, the, the, the key balance, I think, on it is it's got that loose party feel, but still tight on the rhythms and mm -hmm. exact, you know, as far as that goes. So is it challenging or was it challenging to kind of strike that perfect little blend and balance of that? Yes. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. It was. It was. It, it, because, uh, yeah, you wanted to keep it tight. You wanted to keep it tight, but uh, you, you still wanted to have that party feel. I think uh, that was the atmosphere back in those days where you wanted to, and it was all, it was all live. It was done in the studio live. So um, that's, how, that's how we kept it tight, I think, playing, playing all together. The horn parts, the horn played theirs separately, but the rhythm section, we laid down our, our rhythm section at first, and everything was, was tight here. Yeah. Now, you uh, could read music, right? Yes, I could. Yeah, so you had that background. Uh, right. How many others in the group had, you know, sort of a formal musical background, would you say? 
I don't think any I don't think any anybody else had the uh, the theory and the formal background the, the reading part of it uh, maybe a couple of horn guys maybe from the band of high school you know learning from the high school teacher they uh, they probably got some some uh, teachings from the uh, from high school but uh, as far as other form uh, well Kevin Kevin uh, Cool's little brother Amir uh, he was just multi-talented he was just talented he could his ear was fantastic I mean he could pick up he could hear something and play it play it right back play mm -hmm. it right back so he I guess he didn't need that didn't really need that uh, training yeah, it was just all done by ear. So he changed his name to Amir. I wasn't sure um, who that was, really. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because um, later on, that name, you know, comes up. But, yes. um, man, what a talented family, the Bells, huh? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Each one of them, yes. Yes, each one of them. Yeah. Uh, cool is... Cool is great. Cool is great. I, I guess he just plays that one instrument. But uh, Ronald and Kevin, they play multiple instruments. Multiple. They're multi-talented. Multi-talented. Yeah, that, that family. Well, you know, when I asked you about the formal training, what I found is so many of the bands, at least from that era, uh, the keyboard player was typically the one that had the formal training a lot of times the other guys didn't and because yeah. of that you know a lot of times like being the band director or that kind of thing kind of fell to the keyboardist because he's the guy who had that training so yes yeah that's right that's right uh, when i got with the kgs um actually kevin kevin was the musical director for the kgs so i didn't i didn't i left that you know up to him because he, he was I just came in and I didn't want to change anything, didn't want to up, up, upset anything. So he was he was great at it. So we just let him keep doing that. So, so the uh, viewers and listeners know uh, this album, that first one, also had on it. Well, of course, you know the master plan track, um, and who's the man with the master plan? It's kind of like a two part uh, thing, and. Um, other standout tracks to me was Wondering, a uh, real nice kind of upbeat soul track. Yes. Um, yes. Ain't No Time Part 2, which was real jazzy, soul, disco kind of yeah. thing. Yes. And um, Get Down, of course, leads it off, and that's a real great oh, yeah. funky track, too. I forgot all about that. Yeah, Get Down was, yeah, Get Down was hot, yeah. And Boogie was pretty funky, too. Let's Boogie. Let's Boogie, yeah. Yeah. So, um... Did you guys uh, tour on just the first record? Did you open for Cool and the Gang at all? Um, I don't. I don't remember if we went out opening opening up for that, but opening up for them. But we did go out on tour with the first record. Yeah. Yes. Do you remember any of the uh, bands that you opened for or played with? Mm. Oh, that's 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 taking me back let me see uh like, play with so many yeah yeah i'm thinking people like maybe war ohio players or uh... yes yeah we played with war played with ohio players um uh, who else was out at that time i think uh who else was, um average white band no I, I don't remember playing with the average white band but uh, I remember Brick, a group called Brick. Who else was there? Um, Crown Heights Affair, Crown Heights Affair. Mm -hmm. They were on the same label, so we, uh, there was a couple other groups. Cameo, I guess Cameo was out at the time. Uh, Frankie Beverly and Mays. Barquets. Barquets, yes, Barquets. They were um, pretty much our um, adversaries because they had the same same amount, you know, the eight piece band, and they were they were a little bit better than us. We were younger than them, so they schooled us a little bit 
<laughs> and we had to when we had to go after them. It wasn't pleasant. It wasn't pleasant. Uh, so of all those groups, was there anyone that um, obviously the Barquet sounded like they were good? Do you remember anyone else that like you were like, whoa? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, oh boy, Rufus and Chaka Khan. I had to tour with them, and they were fantastic. They were fantastic, uh, fantastic band uh, players. We learned we learned pretty much from everybody. I mean, we used to watch watch everybody. If we go off stage, then we come back and watch their show uh, to the point of trying to pinpoint one one band that I was influenced with the most that we toured with. Uh, I can't really put my finger on it. Were you ever on a on a bill with uh, Parliament or Funkadelic? Yes, yes, we did. Yeah, I think that was uh, a time when I was touring with Cool. I was playing with Cool, and they called us. They called us. George Clinton called us up on stage to be with them, and that was great. That was great. Their show, as you know, their show, the mother, Mothership. That was uh, something to see. That was something to see. And and the honor of them calling us up on the stage, that was like, ah, ah, nice, nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think Cool and the Gang, I mean, they're used to getting um, appreciated by their fellow musicians because I know James Brown did not compliment many folks because he saw them as being competitive and all that. But I do yeah. know that Cool and the Gang is one of the groups that that he would, you know, admit that he he liked what they were doing. So, really, I didn't I didn't know that. Didn't yeah, know in the that. early seventies when they were doing their thing. Um, yeah, yeah, the Godfather appreciated. Yeah. He, wow, wow, that's great to hear. That's yeah. Great to hear. That's... That first record, I mean, you know, that was a tough act to follow because you know that's such a great splashy debut, right? Yes. What yes. do you do for an encore? You know, so. <laughs> right, um, right, right. Find a friend came out. Uh, I guess, actually, well, according to this, two years later. But um, what what transpired, Kevin, um, into making and working on that record? That record, um, we had we were on the road, and we had um, some singers doing backup. They were a group of four, of four guys that were called Tomorrow's Edition. And they were on the gang, uh, uh, gang label also. We had uh, some singers. There was four female singers um, who grew up on the same block that I grew up. And they were young ladies. They were called Something Sweet. And so we were using them as, back, as vocals we wasn't too good vocally and I guess Ronald wanted to have uh, this album be more vocal more vocal friendly <laughs> maybe I guess you could say uh, we could do harmony but it was that band harmony really didn't work so we brought them we brought them in the studio with us to do that that album and that kind of changed the sound it was a different mm -hmm. I guess you could say it, it was it was still funky, still funky, but a lot more polished, a lot more smoother. Yeah, you know, with the vocals, vocal tracks, uh, male vocals, female vocals, blending, blending with the music. Yeah, I think that was a great album. I really loved that album. Also, all the songs on that album. Yeah, it's uh, very impressive. Um, I mentioned in the intro, but I mean some of the tracks on here on the money. That one's real cool in the gang style funk yes. track. Yeah. Um, I believe in music is real kind of funky but jazzy too. Oh, okay. Um, together and waiting at the bus stop. I really like the there's like real tight kind of like guitar picking grooves, less of the yes. less of the rhythm strumming and actually some kind of picking and more um, I don't know, more of a picking style, but still really funky. Mm -hmm. That that's uh, highlighting uh, uh, Kevin Bell's uh, uh, um, the way he played guitar. He was uh, the way he just strummed the guitar was uh, he had a certain way that that he would have these the licks that he would do 
would um it seemed like it would overpower it, it would be out front of all the other music it was a certain style that he had great style yeah that that embellished our, our songs um inspiration real kind of like uh I, I would say it's like more of a breezier kind of vibe to it, but still has yeah. got that funk undertone, you know? Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, and you had some, uh, toward the end of that record, you got into some like kind of gospel-y kind of stuff. Mm. Yeah. Uh, thank you, dear Lord. Yes, that was one of uh, co uh, Ronald Bell's uh, compositions. That was, yeah. Yeah, uh, more of a gospel flavor to that one. The whole structure of that song. Find a Friend was definitely different from anything else. And to me, it uh, made me think of like sort of like an Isley Brothers kind of vibe to it, you know? Mm. Oh, okay. Never thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so did you guys go out and play these live too? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Yep. So you had more people on stage than the eight? Did you have some backup oh, singers? Yeah. Now they travel with us. Now we travel with, as a family. Yeah. The whole, the whole. Uh, that was that was pretty rough. Yeah, because you, now you got what eight, eight and eight. You got sixteen people. Yeah. That's and you got your roadies, your roadies you're carrying, and manager, and uh, that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to take on the road. So. Uh, we all knew each other. We all grew up, you know, knowing each other. So it was like family. It was like family. I, I, I don't remember any problems, you know, being with that many people. But we had a great time. Did you guys do uh, some TV? Did you do Soul Train or anything like that? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. I remember doing Soul Train when we was out in California. Um, I remember that distinctly distinctively uh yeah doing soul train uh i don't know which I, it was, most likely it was keep on bumping i, I guess because that was a, a major hit that was the major hit i don't know if it was a, from find, find a friend i don't know if we did anything from find a friend um i don't think it was from waiting at the bus stop or one of the other cuts I think there was the early, the early album that we did Soul Train. We also did a TV show in Philadelphia. We did the theme song for a TV show that uh, slips me right now. It's, uh, oh boy, I have to come back to that one. That, that was a TV show, oh boy. Oh, The Party? Is that what it's called? Yes, yes. Right. Uh, was it party sh TV show? Was it the, I think it was a party TV show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we did the theme song to that. And uh, I don't remember any other television. Uh, I, noticed, I noticed on the second record, uh, Kevin started using the Amir name that we spoke about. Um, before that, was there ever confusion in the studio if they would someone would yell Kevin? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe that's it. Yeah, there was. Yeah. Well, they didn't call me Kevin. They so if somebody said Kevin, we knew what they were talking oh, about. Oh, called Kevin. you Ice. They called me Ice. Yeah, uh, everybody called me Ice. Right. Yeah. That makes sense. So, how, how did the band uh, and yourself feel about you know how this uh, Find a Friend did? You know how it was received, and how how did you feel about that? We 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 liked that album. We liked that album. Uh, we thought it was received very well. We thought it was received very well. Um, I don't know if the record company uh, gave it a lot of promotion. Maybe it was a lack of promotion on that one. But uh, we felt good about it coming out of the studio and, and, and the songs. The songs were great songs would play great uh, I guess we didn't get the airplay that we needed for that find a friend album hmm. not like 
keep on bumping was hitting the airways. I don't think any of uh, Waiting at the Bus Stop was playing. Uh, yeah, that was the, the one hit that they played on the radio or for that album. Yeah. But I was just curious because, you know, bumping blew up so big. I was wondering if, you know, you guys were like, yeah, you know, we didn't, we didn't get a hit like that off this one. Right, right. That's right. 